and I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up, rise up, rise up. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the Midnight Ride. My name is David Carrico, and I'm here tonight with my co-host, John Pounders, and we're so very thankful for each and every one of you that are going to be joining us for the broadcast this evening. Tonight, our broadcast is entitled, The Five Satans Who Seek to Destroy Humans and Angels. And tonight, we're going to be giving you a big-picture look at the spiritual world through the lens of the book of Enoch. And we're going to be showing you the structure, and we're going to be focusing on the role of the Satans. Yes, not Satan, but the Satans. And we're going to be focusing on the role that they played, not only in the destruction of mankind, but in the fall of the bad angels. It's going to be a fascinating broadcast with a lot of keen insight for God's saints that are engaged in spiritual warfare. So get your spiritual warfare sword ready and buckle up because we are now live, live, live. What's up, YouTube? Truth Squad, Midnight Ride Truth Squad. We're always happy to be here on Saturday nights. This is the highlight of my week. And uh, the week is just starting. This is going to be the first day of the week coming up. And we're excited to move forward to what we're doing. We have so much. This show is going to be awesome, first off. This is something me and David talked about, what, about a year, a year or two ago. We were in the other, other office when you started your study on this subject. Uh, very compelling. No doubt you're not going to hear any study like this online uh, in this detail. This is the thing we love to do is go back to the ancient text, go back and look and see what's really going on. Because as we know, we are living in a world where the rulers of this world, the archons, the rulers are liars and they tell us everything the opposite of what is true. And so the scripture tells us the truth. We're going to dig into that. Uh, but before we do, I'm going to play a quick little intro. Thank you guys. This is a word from our sponsors. Tonight's sponsors on NYS TV are Joshua Watts Leather Company, makes the best custom leather products this side of the Congo River, with anything from custom book covers, gun holsters, wallets, handbags, and book bags, Joshua Watts is the premier craftsman. Go to joshuawattsleather.com today. What would Jesus do? Well, let me tell you what he did do. He wore fringes on the corners of his garments to follow the command in scripture, which says we should wear them as a reminder to obey the commandments of God. The golden spool rules are all handcrafted products done to support a widow and give people the tools to follow the creator. Check out their great tzitzit designs. Go to thegoldenspoolrules.com. Don't forget, go and check out nystv.org. This is a place where you can find our exclusive documentary. Vampires, Lies of the Immortal, and more, only on nystv.org. All right, guys, that is a word from our sponsors. Make sure to check all that stuff out. And David, let's get the show on the road, man. Let's get started. Um, I was almost going to bring some hot wings tonight, some super hot wings, but I thought that might be a bad idea. 
to eat right before we go on the show, but I'll tell you what, man, those sound really good right now. I was watching a show where they eat these hot wings and they go as hot as they can. I thought that might be a good way to start off one of our programs here, see how hot we can go with it. <laughs> well, I like hot wings and I like the Book of Enoch. I don't know how much they mix together, but uh, anyway, we've got the Book of Enoch and we're going to begin with the text and the doctrine of Christ in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12, verses 24 through 26. And this scripture speaks to the organization in the satanic kingdom. What we're going to see in this study, by looking at it throughout, uh, through the lens. There we go. Put it up in, the, up in your grill there. All David. righty, I'll get it up in my grill. <laughs> All right. What we'll learn from looking at this through the lens of Enoch is that not only is the kingdom of God, but also the kingdom of Satan very organized, and we're going to be looking at this hierarchy and structure through the lens of Enoch, focusing on the Satans that were pivotal, pivotal in the original split. Now, the scripture says, but when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. Now, there is a structure and a hierarchy, and this is what we would call first heaven spiritual warfare, which is not what we're looking at. But, and Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself." How then, how shall then his kingdom stand? And we're going to be looking at the details of Satan's kingdom, how it originally split, how it is structured. And in the book of Enoch, which uh, I think most of our regular Midnight Ride listeners uh, are very familiar with our book of Enoch commentary, we get a lot of new listeners all the time. And if you're someone that doesn't like the book of Enoch and just wants to read the Bible, I'm so fine with that. And I believe that everything is in the Bible that should be in the Bible. But I also believe that God has brought the book of Enoch back at this point in time, specifically for God's people that are going to be going through the end time tribulation. We're going to show you what Enoch had to say about that. An insight into the dark realm and also insight into the angelic realm on God's side is going to be very, very important for us. We're standing at a point in time when we know that the abyss is going to be opened. And many of these creatures that we're going to be speaking of this evening are going to be coming out. Now, whether you'd like it or not, uh, they're going to be coming out. The restrainer is going to be removed. The abyss is going to be open. So it might not be a bad thing for us to know a few things about these issues. But in Enoch chapter 61 and verse 10, this verse speaks to this structure. And it's a complex one. Um, and, he's, and he will summon all the host of the heavens and all the holy ones above and the host of God, the cherubic, seraphim, and ophanim, and all the angels of power and all the angels of principalities and the elect one and the other powers on the earth and over the water. Now, there's a lot of stuff going on there, isn't there? And even more than we'll get to. And some of these are in the first heaven, some are in the second, and some are in the third. And we're going to be given kind of a top-down, big-picture look today. But there's a lot of complexity to the spiritual world. And I believe in praying targeted prayers. The more specific we can be when we pray, the more effective we will be. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man does indeed 
avail much. Now, there's something that comes out in this text in Enoch 61.10 is the old finan. Now, there's a word that, you know, people will say, well, that's not in the Bible. Well, it is, but it isn't. Uh, I'll show you what I mean there. Now, the word, and I, um, some of our friends, that would be what would be called King James only. And I only use the King James Bible, but I'm not really a King James only -er because in the strict sense of that word, they do not believe in looking up words in the Hebrew and the Greek. Now, here is an instance where I believe that is very, very helpful. And I believe that we have an inspired translation. And to have an inspired translation, you got to have an, an inspired and an errant inerrant text. But anyway, uh, in Ezekiel 10 and 9, here's an instance where I think it might be good to look up a word in the Hebrew. And when I looked, behold, the four wheels of the cherubims, one wheel by one cherub and another wheel by another cherub, and the appearance of the wheels was as the color of a barrel stone. Now that word wheel in the Hebrew is is the word ophan, and this is the word that we see in the uh, book of Enoch, ophanim. And literally what we have in Ezekiel 10 and 9, the ophanim is a spiritual creature that is working with the cherubim to transport the very throne of God. Now in this picture, this is really a cool picture, and it's misleading as the way that the author uh, originally intended, and here's old Ezekiel here, and he's having a UFO visitation. Well, this is half true, and I don't even want to say it's half true, because Ezekiel didn't see a UFO. He saw a cherubim and an ophanim bearing the very throne of God with Jesus Christ upon the throne. It was a theophany of our Lord Jesus Christ unto Ezekiel, but it is true that fallen Ophanim, you see, there's good Ophanim and there's bad Ophanim. Some are fallen, some are not, just like the cherubim. There are cherubim that have not fallen, cherubim that have fallen. And many of the sightings that are orbs, very frequently people see, they say, see orbs, balls of light, stuff like this all the time. These are fallen ophanim, and they're huge in the lore of the UFO community. And these are right here explained in the book of Enoch. And here's one place not only where we can get insight, not only from the English but the Hebrew, but also we can get insight from the book of Enoch to help us understand what's going on here. Now, in the book of Enoch, chapter 1 and verse 1, the words of the blessing of Enoch, wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation when all the wicked and godless are to be removed. Now, here's one place where uh, the book of Enoch loses a lot of our dispensationalist friends because they don't believe that they are going to be here. They think they're going to be removed. But in the book of Enoch, just like in the doctrine of Christ, he said the tares are coming out before the wheat in Matthew 13, 30. And here we see that the wicked and godless are going to be removed. And the book is intended for God's people that will be here in the time of tribulation. And I always have that in my mind's eye when I read the book of Enoch, and I always ask myself, if this was the intent of this book, how is this information going to help me? Understanding the spiritual world, and as I've already stated, listen, these guys are coming whether we want to believe it or not. 
you know, the restrainer will be removed. The abyss will be opened. I believe it now. And for a time, we have been experiencing the release of spirits that we have not had to deal with in times past. Things are not going to get better and better. Things are going to get worse and worse. But for the child of God, if we understand our authority in Christ and on the cross, we will know that these entities will be subject unto us. So this is why understanding is a principal thing. What really scares someone when they wake up in a dark room is not knowing where they're at or understanding where things are. You see, and we don't want to wake up in a dark room when the shoe drops. We want to know what's going on, and we want to understand these things because people that don't know some of the things are, that are coming when they see them come to pass uh, as the doctrine of Christ said, men's hearts will be failing them for fear, and many people will take their own life. Sad but true. It, it will happen. You want to say something, John? When you do, just jump in there, brother. Well, I just want to say that it's it's pretty amazing, you know, uh, given the the major ancient alien push, ma major disclosure push. There's a right now in Area 51. There is a big thing going on there. This is when they were supposed to storm Area 51. They're having a big uh, party there oh, right yeah. now as we speak. And the thing you said about Alphonums is interesting because I would say 50% uh, of the people that are listening tonight have probably seen these Alphonums oh, yeah. flying through these air, these orbs of light flying through the air, and all the people that are uh, have had these uh, ideas and are, are had these sights have seen that stuff. And that to me, that's really interesting. Also, you know, I've talked to people, you know, you talk about them coming from the abyss, which I believe they're, they are not extraterrestrial. They are, some of them are terrestrial here. And then you have the different heavens, but some of them are literally coming from the ground. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. And there's a guy, you know, and I'm not going to give his name, no way, no how, but he does honor water surveillance for the Navy and they hear things. And when you, if you ever find somebody that's ever done underwater surveillance from the Navy, Dig some questions from them, you know, dig some questions and ask them what they've seen and what they've heard. Uh, very interesting and amazing stuff. And that's about as far as I'm going to go. I don't want to get this guy in trouble. But, um, you know, there's Russians that said it. I've heard Russians say it before on uh, Ancient Aliens broadcasts, you know, that they're they know where there's these beings coming from the water and they, they just they don't want to mess with them because it's way more powerful than what they can configure, you know, themselves. So interesting stuff. Anyways, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I know you got a lot to go through tonight to get to this uh, five Satan idea. Cause this is a lot of people are here just to hear about that. I can tell you that right now. So, yeah. Um, and, um, the, uh, research that we did into the Mothman episode, uh, which was at Plount Mount Pleasant, West Virginia, which is on the Ohio river, the same river that goes right through Evansville. And during that time period, the people that were on boats on the Ohio River nightly all the way from uh, Mount Pleasant, West Virginia, into Evansville through Louisville, these Ophonums were seen nightly. There was just a rash of these Ophonums uh, during this whole um Mothman episode, but that's just another interesting aside, but I bet there are many, many, many people that have seen these. Now, we're going to go through Enoch chapter 6, verse 1 through 6, and we have a lot of new listeners that I'm sure do not know uh, the basics of the sons of gods and daughters of men as is recorded in the book of Enoch. But John, would you like to read this text and just comment on it briefly? Sure, I'll read it and I will comment. Enoch chapter 6, starting in verse 1, going through 6. And it came to pass, when the children of men had multiplied, that in those days were born unto them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of the heavens, saw and lusted after them, and said to one another, Come, let us choose wives from among the children of men, and beget us children. And Simyaza, who was their leader, said unto them, I fear you will not indeed agree to do this, and I alone shall have to pay the penalty of a great sin. And they all answered him and said, Let us all swear an oath and all bind ourselves by mutual imprecations not to abandon this plan, but to do this thing. Then swear they all together and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. 
and they were in all 200 who descended in the days of Jared on the summit of Mount Hermon, and they called it Mount Hermon because they had sworn and bound themselves by mutual imprecations upon it. And so uh, for those of you that don't know this, this is the same story that's told in Genesis chapter 6. It doesn't go into as much detail, but in Genesis chapter 6, we have a very similar story. You can go check that out, but it basically says the sons of God came into the daughters of men. They had children. They bore, or they bore giants. There was these giants that were on the earth. We've done so many shows going through that, going through the Hebrew of it so we can make sense of it and show exactly what that means. But this is the basis where we get all mythologies around, where we get demigods, where we get these half-god beings, these these um, titans, these all these different, depending on what civilization you go to, they call them different things, but it's the same story that is throughout all ancient civilizations. Uh, in the scripture, in the book of Enoch, it really details it from the side of the righteous one, right? Uh, you're going to get all kinds of different sides depending on what you look at, but we want it from the side of the righteous living God. So this, we're going to go into Enoch chapter six. And if you guys are anything like me, you've studied all the mythologies, you've seen uh, all of the different stories that go along with it and how they are tied into this Enoch 6, Genesis 6 experiment slash uh, really, and you, you'll find out that these watchers not only were lusting after women, but they were, um, they had an adversary against them as well. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Um, let's go down here, John, to Enoch chapter 40 and verse 7. And we will come back and we're going to pick up the seven angels. And the big picture here, for people that have studied with us on FOJC, we talk about a concept called the Satanic Quadrangle. And this is another uh, in-depth look at the structure of the satanic kingdom. And this is so involved, we're just going to be able to hit some high points tonight to give you an idea. But the big picture is, at the top, there are four groups of seven angels. Two groups of seven are fallen. Two groups of seven are not. And the two groups of seven angels, which fell at the instigation of the Satans, they have structured the dark world in a quadrangle. For instance, in Israel, there are four Kabbalistic cities. And this ties into so much that it's a real topic of itself. But what we're going to be looking at here with the Satans, and everybody knows that there is Satan. Not everyone believes he's real. But what people don't know is that there were Satans, plural, in the book of Enoch. And we understand, and we're going to show from Scripture, that Satan is a seraphim, and these Satans are also seraphims. And the reason why there are structures in seven, we're going to show you that there are five Satans that are in the book of Enoch. There are two in Scripture, and this number seven is the imitation of the perfect number of God. It's about imitation. It's about trying to reproduce the kingdom of darkness in such a way that it fools people into thinking it's the kingdom of God. And he's doing a very, very good job at that. Now, let's look at Enoch chapter 40 and verse 7. And I heard the fourth voice trim fending off the Satans, and forbidding them to come before the Lord of spirits to accuse them who dwell on the earth. Now, who's the accuser of the brethren? It's Satan, isn't it? But here we see in the book of Enoch that we have more than just Satan as the accuser of the brethren, and I think most of us know the story of Job where Job was accused at the, at the throne by Satan, and uh, 
he had to obtain permission from the Father to bring judgment and trial upon Job. Well, here we see that it's just not Satan, but Satan's. And we're going to see that there are five accomplices here in the book of Enoch that are in reality working against the children of God right now in the third heaven. Now, every believer that's born again knows what the accuser of the brethren does. When you fail, he will beat you to death with it. And the Word of God tells us, 1 John 2 and 1, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So when he accuses, we take it to the throne and we deal with it. We don't let him beat us up with guilt and condemnation. This is one of the primary functions of not only Satan, but let's read it again. And I heard the fourth voice fending off the Satans and forbidding them to come before the Lord of Spirits to accuse them who dwell on the earth. And you see, this is spiritual warfare right here. And there was a voice fighting with these other Satans that were coming to accuse, you see. And we have something to say about the matter. You see, we can come before our great high priest at the right hand of the Father, and we can have a say in what goes on in this contest here in the court of heaven. Now, in Enoch chapter 65 and verse 6, and a command has gone forth from the presence of the Lord concerning those who dwell on the earth that their ruin is accomplished because they have learnt all the secrets of the angels and all the violence of the Satans and all their powers, the most secret ones. Now, this tells us something here in the text. Um... Almost everyone has heard about Satan. Most people, and everyone's heard about angels. Most people know about cherubim and seraphim. They might not know a lot. Almost nobody except Midnight Ride or FOJC people, and that, it's others, but much less people know about the Ophanim. Uh, and even less than that, the most secret ones are these Satans. These are the ones that are the most hidden by the powers of darkness. And almost always, the thing that you know least about is the most evil and the most deadly to you. And here we're going to see that there are in total seven fallen seraphim with Satan at the head. Um, the most secret ones, and all the power of those who practice sorcery, and the power of witchcraft, and the power of those who make molten images for the whole earth. And these Satans are into, in, intricately entwined with the powers of sorcery, black magic, idolatry, and the whole thing as we would very much expect to be the case. Now, in Enoch 69 and 3, speaking of these Satans, and these are the chiefs of their angels. Now, here again, we see hierarchy. And the angels are underneath what I refer to as the higher celestial beings. And you've got... Uh, Higher than the angels, we would have the cherubim, the seraphim, the ophanim, and over those, we would have at the very top, well, the seraphim. The Satans are seraphim, and we're going to show you in multiple scriptural references why that is the case. And this will be another place in both of these places, in the Torah and the book of Numbers 21, and in Isaiah 14, we're going to be seeing another place where looking at the Hebrew is going to help us a whole lot here. But, and these are the chiefs of their angels and their names and their chief ones over hundreds and and over fifties and over 
tens. So we definitely see here, according to the book of Enoch, that these Satans are over ruling the, the regular angels. Now, in Enoch chapter 69 and verse 4, we're beginning here the roll call of the five Satans, and we'll get some insight into what they did and what they're going to do in the future. In Enoch chapter 69 and verse 4, the name of the first, Jaquan, that is the one who led astray all the sons of God and brought them down to the earth and led them astray through the daughters of men. Now, in Genesis 6 and 4, and John, would you like to read that just in case we have uh, some Genesis, of our new listeners? Genesis yeah, 6 Yeah, just 4. read Genesis 6 and 4, because we don't want to do things in a way that leaves new listeners in the dust. And I know a lot of this... Um, because so many people just don't give credence to the book of Enoch, you might say, yeah, that's just all a bunch of hooey de bluey. And if you do, that's fine. But I think there's something to this here. Read Genesis 6 4 for us, John. All right. So, Genesis 6 4, it says, There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came into, in unto the daughters of men, and they bear children. To them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And um, when you look at that verse right there, the word giants, Nephilim, and you look at look at this mighty men, men of renown, you know, what do you think of? Well, the first thing I thought of when I first read this verse, and when I first became a believer and I read this verse, I was thinking Hercules. Yeah. I was thinking guys like uh, Hercules and um, Achilles and all these different heroes sure, yeah. of the temple. And the interesting thing about this, David, and of course— I'm not going to go on a long rabbit trail about it, but in those areas where these these heroes were, and if you go to some of these ancient places that haven't been touched by, you know, a lot of civilizations, they haven't been touched by Christianity or any kind of other religions, you have this presiding demon that they make sacrifices to, and they're always because it's always tormenting them. This demon, if you don't do this, you're going to have sacrifices. And and in the scripture, it tells us, in in actually in Enoch, and you have this one in your previous one of your previous slides, but it talks about how they continue to go against mankind after they die, even they become evil spirits that yeah. wander the world and do that to people. Anyways, I won't go into that too much, but I just wanted to kind of give a, give a full um, spectrum of what we're looking at here. If this is the first time you read this verse, you are getting ready to embark on one of the coolest journeys and learning yeah. experiences of your life. Cause I remember for me, it was, it was the best. It was awesome. Yeah. So, and if you think that, the book of Enoch is worthless, you know, uh, you don't have to give it any credence. And like I say, if people that just believe the Bible, they're going to be fine. But I believe, as I said before, and I believe this strongly, that's why we're doing on the Subscription Network a complete in-depth commentary on the book of Enoch, because the more I look at it, the more I'm convinced that it is right. It was quoted in Scripture. Not only is it quoted in the book of Jude, but it also validates the author, the Enoch being the author in the Word of God. So I think this is pretty important stuff. And uh, anyway, this term that John read in Genesis 6, 4, the sons of God. This is the very term that's used here. And we see here, and the sons of God were the angels that sinned with the daughters of men, as it says here. So what we see here is, why did the angels leave their first estate and come to earth to cohabit with human women. The reason was the seraphim. Now, this tells us something very insightful. The angels did not start the rebellion against God. It was started by the seraphim, and there were seven of them. And we're going to see the role that a couple of these five seraphim played in the defection of the angels. And here, let's let's read the verse again. The name of the first, Jaquan, that is the one who led astray all the sons of God 
and brought them down to the earth and led them astray through the daughters of men. The angels didn't come up with this on their own. It was put into their mind by the Satans. And if, and, and indeed in fact, if these seraphim could trick angels into falling, we would not want to underestimate what they could do with us. Satan, the king of all the kingdom of darkness, and these other seraphim, I think it might be good to know a little bit and uh, say a prayer too, don't you? Enoch chapter 69 and verse 5, and the second was named Asbeel. He imparted to the holy sons of God evil counsel and led them astray so that they defiled their bodies with the daughters of men. Now, what I see happening here, it's Jaquan that got them to go for it to begin with. He's the one that persuaded them, and it was Asbeel that showed them how to do it. He gave them the actual counsel of how to make the transformation to where they could actually cohabit with human women. And one of the tremendous um, errors that I believe is the Sethite theory. Uh, the Sethite theory is absolutely one of the most unbiblical premises that people put forth, and it's extremely popular in many, many Bible seminaries and Bible schools, and that is this, that the sons of God in Genesis 6-4 and in these other texts in Enoch, that they are just the line of Seth. Well, this is just so ridiculous that uh, a human being mates with another human being and giants come out. I mean, it just makes no sense on so many levels, and that's not the purview of our study. But I mean, that's and that, what you're saying there is not even the half of the proof and evidence that oh, yeah. is there. If the people they look into the original language, I mean, there's no doubt of what it's talking about, you know. And and um, that is a weird, it's a weird theory, you know, the Sethite theory. It's Where crazy. does it come from? What? It, how does it make sense? It just it, it is amazing to me how people can run with that theory. I don't know. If it stems from kind of the uh, Sadducee type mentality of nothing spiritual, you know, you don't raise when you die, none of that stuff. I think it might have to stem from that. I mean, because there's really evidence worldwide that this happened. There's evidence, you know, oh, the mythologies yeah. oh, yeah. are all over the place. Oh, that, yeah. And when, what most people call mythologies, I call the history of that land. You know, that's what they're talking about, so. Yeah, and, and we could go on and on about this. Without understanding the sons of God and the daughters of men, how do you explain God going in there and wiping out uh, men, women, and children, many of these places in the lands of Canaan? It's because they were subhuman. They were part human, but not a very big part, and that's because of this genetic inbreeding. So if you miss this, you miss a whole lot. So it's important stuff. And we're, we're even going deeper here into this understanding. But this is nothing beyond the capabilities of these evil ones to be able to have the angels make this transformation. And it was certainly done with very much a demonic anointing of... Uh, Enoch 69, verses 6 through 7. It says, And the third was named Gad Real. He it is who showed the children of men all the blows of death, and he led astray Eve and showed the weapons of death to the sons of men, and the shield and the coat of mail and the sword for battle, and all the weapons of death to the children of men. And this Gadriel uh, was the one that, as it states in the scripture, uh, he taught human beings to kill other human beings with gusto and uh, serving the god of war. Now, there are those that say 
that Gadriel is Satan because he led astray Eve. Well, there's a lot of problems with that. Gadriel is not Satan. He is one of the five Satans. And Eve is just like us. We haven't just gone astray once. We've gone astray more than once. All of us haven't we? So to, to say that Eve, uh, and you know, this was not the original uh, deception of Eve. That was a big one, wasn't it? But this was some subsequent uh, time when this Satan led Eve astray. What it, the details of it were, we don't know. But we do know that it happened and that Eve was the target of this fallen Satan, Gadriel, and that Gadriel, in whatever enterprise he engaged in, was successful in a subsequent leading astray of Eve after the first big one, if you will. Now, in Enoch chapter 69, verse 8 through 11, and all of these things are huge, um, in verse 8, and the fourth was named Panume. He taught the children of men the bitter and the sweet. Now, this is relating to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the bitter and the sweet and teaching things to men that they should not know or look into. But he taught the children of men the bitter and the sweet and he taught them all the secrets of their wisdom. Now, there's a gentleman out there that teaches Gnosticism uh, with the Christian veneer. I'll just put it like that. And this individual says of himself, I don't call myself a Christian. I call myself a wisdom seeker. And this is the term that is used for the wisdom of the androgynous God. And I'm going to show that to you. And there's so much of this that God was originally androgynous. We've talked about this on a lot of shows. And it's popular in a lot of genres calling the Holy Ghost she. And this is the wisdom of Panume. This is becoming popular uh, through the shack and these series. And the, the author of the shack followed up with his new book. I can't read. I think maybe Eve is the name of that book. But he teaches in detail the female Holy Spirit in his follow-up book to the shack. But it goes on to say in this text, and he instructed mankind in writing with ink and paper, and thereby many sin from eternity to eternity un until this day. And it's very true that it's not a sin to write things down, but it's also very true that the writing down of these esoteric texts, this is the work of Panume, this occult wisdom. And he says in verse 10, for men were not created for such a purpose to give confirmation to their good faith with pen and ink. The word of God is written by God, and these counterfeit texts were written by the evil ones. For men were created exactly like the angels to the intent that they should continue pure and righteous, and death which destroys everything, could not have taken hold on them. But through this, their knowledge, they are perishing, and through this power, it is consuming me. And that doesn't mean that every book that isn't in the canon has no value. If it were, we shouldn't be reading the book of Enoch. But we have to be very, very discerning. There are many, many books out there, the Nagamati Codices, uh, Second and Third Enoch, on and on and on. There are many books out there that are not good. They're from the spiritual dark side. And we've got to be able to discern that. If you just go willy-nilly, uh, and say, oh, it's an extra biblical book, that's cool. You can get burned real, real bad. 
Imagine if nobody wrote any books from the time of the beginning till now. The only book that was available would be the Word of Righteousness. That would have been an amazing thing. And it says, it says the um, men were created for. Or where was that? It? it says thereby many sin from eternity to eternity until this day. So people are still getting caught up by this um, thing that has been shown to mankind. Um, and I'm not saying all books written, like you said, are bad, but if you really think about it, if we didn't, if we didn't have all these books to decipher from, we would, it wouldn't be that hard to decipher what's true. There's so many books on every little aspect of every little thing. I mean, I, to imagine how many books have been published from the beginning till now is just overwhelming. There's so much to flood your minds with. And this is big defilement. This is something that defiles oh, yeah. man big time because oh, yeah. most people spend their whole life on a quest for truth. Their whole life they're spending on a quest. Yeah. They can never figure out the truth. They can never fully find it. They can never fully understand it because there's 5 million things they have to consider to figure out what the truth is. Um, so I'm thankful for the Holy Spirit, man. I'm thankful for the oh, Spirit yeah. being able to rest upon us, bear witness to who he is so we can find out the truth and decipher the truth for ourselves. because there's a lot of people in this world that will never – fully understand the truth because they're constantly on a quest for it. They're all constantly trying to find out and learn what is the truth for them. And then they get swept away by this book and that book and this book and that book. I mean, when you got 5 million things to consider, you'll never find the truth unless the truth bites you in the nose like it did for me. Thank God. But hopefully that happens to all of you guys listening. The truth will bite you in the nose. And I'm saying that metaphorically, it, you know, <laughs> but, you know, so. Uh. Yes, indeed. I'm going to give just a quick example of how this um, slips in. And it's slipping in, uh, like I say, through the uh, author of The Shack. This is a book entitled Epidemic. I'll just hold it up. It's written by a gentleman by the name of Russ Hauk. And I'll just read a couple quick snippets here to show of how subtle this is. On page 340, he says, Adam was created with life within himself, able to reproduce by himself. Now, that's a big porky, isn't it? And this is very much in line with the Nagamati Codices that teaches that Yalbadoth had sex with himself, just like a cosmic earthworm, and brought forth seven androgynous beings. On page 341, he calls this crucial point. He says, Adam, the first man, was a pluralistic being, male, female, just like his creator was. Eve was inside Adam. Now, wait a minute. <laughs> Eve wasn't inside Adam. The Bible says God took a rib out of Adam and made Eve. It didn't say Eve was in there and he pulled Eve out, you see. Uh, we go here from the teaching of the Word of God. This is rabbinical teaching. Eve was inside Adam before the rib operation. That's another porky, which is why Adam was referred to as them and they. So these things are snuck in and they're accepted because people don't think about them. You know, God is not androgynous. This, as we have talked about on a lot of shows, is Luciferian. It's not biblical. And this is the wisdom that is coming from Panume that is still very, very toxic and being propagated in a lot of different directions today. In the book of Numbers, now here we're going to see another text where it's very beneficial for us to look at the Hebrew as well as the English in the King James Bible. And this is one of the, the presentations we did back in 2016 on the uh, Exposing the Darkness Conference here in Evansville. And uh, we did the presentation on Now You See TV and uh, Lucifer, the son of Satan. Was that really 2016? I thought it was uh, 2015. Well, was it, it 2016? I was thinking 2016. Maybe it was 2015. I, who knows? It seems like it was forever ago. Yeah. But, yeah, um, wow. Anyways. But the basic uh, 
uh, been a lot of water under the bridge since then, had there? There has been a lot of water under the bridge. Been a couple typhoons underneath the bridge. Yeah, and a couple of all that. It's been, it's been interesting. <laughs> but my basic premise in this presentation was that when the Bible says that Lucifer is the son of the morning, well, angels don't have babies, and the literal Hebrew word there is shakar. So. Lucifer is not a fallen angel, neither is he Satan. Lucifer is a Nephilim. And do you, do you know how many scriptures in the Bible say that Lucifer is Satan? You got it. None. Zero. Nada. And the same thing, and I understand. And it doesn't really matter if you want to use the word Lucifer or you want to use the word Shakar. It doesn't matter. You can use those words it still doesn't say that he's Satan, whether you see it as Shakar or you see it as Lucifer. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yeah, and, and Shakar was Lucifer's father. Mm -hmm. And also, in Ezekiel 28, the uh, anointed cherub that covereth. Well, it doesn't say anywhere in this text that that cherubim is Satan. And people just believe it because they're told that. Zero scripture to say that the anointed cherub in Ezekiel 28 is Satan. So I teach what's in the Bible, not what's not in the Bible. Let everything be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses, and if you stick to that, you'll do well, and and you'll come into truth. And that's that's so important, And you know, because most of the worldview I know I had when I was uh, growing up in church was that there's really only one group of bad beings out there. They're all fallen angels. You don't yeah. know... The difference between them, you don't know their function, you don't know any of that stuff. And people would say, well, why does it even matter? Well, I think the reason it matters is because we have a world structure right now that is uh, controlled by these beings that we're talking about here. And when pe people don't realize that, you know, they when they say, oh, Satan's this or that, Satan's a dog. Well, here's the deal. Satan is actually in control of the world we live in. If he wasn't, he wouldn't have been able to take Jesus Yeshua up to the mountain and say, I'll give you all of these places. He wouldn't have been able to do that had he not controlled them. And right now he has beans and, and all these different things that are actually um, ancient. You know, these things have been around for a long time. There's been a usurping of, of the kings of the earth. There's been a usurping of all of the uh, institutions of the earth. And they have a they have a viewpoint that's ancient and a viewpoint that goes out further than mankind do. Because if you think about some of the plans that they're instituting, there's people been people setting up a one world order when they knew it wasn't going to come till a thousand years later. And why is that? Because there's a spirit driving behind that. There is a actual beings driving behind these things. When we hear the word dominions and we hear the word principalities, thrones and all these different things, we think. We see the shadow of those things, right? We see the shadow of those things of earth, like Game of Thrones, for instance. You see the shadows, but there's literal actual thrones taking and controlling areas in the scripture. We see the Prince of Tyre, the King of Tyre. We see all that. It's pretty amazing when you really think about what the, what the implications of us bowing down, being brainwashed by the media, uh, deciding that we are going to trust everything that we hear. There is major... Um, side effects to that that cause uh, the world we live in today really i mean when just just to go off on a little tangent epstein you know he supposedly oh, yeah. died in prison you don't hear anything else about it but you have king people that are of, of royal bloodlines and all these different people that are mentioned in his thing but ah he's dead let's throw it away you know we know there's something going on people are starting to wake up and see that but um it's an amazing thing, and I don't want to go off on a rabbit trail real too much right now. But I just I think that it's important that people try to understand that um, if they don't if they're not aware that they're trying to be deceived, if they're not aware there's something major and big and heavy and powerful trying to deceive them, like they deceived the watchers, which are way smarter than you are. They deceived the watchers. They can deceive you too, and we have to be aware that the institutions of this world are controlled by them. If we're not aware of that, we'll be deceived by who knows what. I mean, everything's fake. You know, everything that we see, you know, if, if anyways, go ahead, David. Well, think about it like this. Um, and I'm sure there are some people tonight you're hearing for the first time that Lucifer is not Satan and that Satan is not the anointed cherub in Ezekiel 28, but 
Think about this for a moment. And there's no scripture in the Bible for either. Now, if these Satans and Satan were so clever that they deceived the angels of God, are they capable of deceiving the mass of mankind into believing something that's not in the Bible for the purpose of masking what they're really up to? I think that's extremely possible, and I well, I and I believe it, and I could back that up with um, other things, but that's not our purview here. But in our prayer life, praying specific prayers is very important. Targeted prayers. We talk about targeted individuals. I like to target Satan, and I target him with prayer and with the Word of God. I am going to target him, and I want to shoot bullets that hit right at the heart of what he's doing. So there's more than just an intellectual element to that which we're talking about tonight. Now, let's look at this text in the book of Numbers, chapter 21, verse 8 and 9. Now, in verse 8, And the Lord said unto Moses, Make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. Now, in verse 8, the word serpent, if you look it up, that's why I tell people, I say, the first book you get is your King James Bible. The second book you get is your Strong's Concordance. And the third book you get is your Webster's 1828 Dictionary. And you'll all be off to a pretty good start. But here's the value of not just reading the King James Bible. And if that's all you do, I'm good with that. Don't have a problem with it. But here's why I tell people... Use the King James Bible and get a Strong's Concordance. Now, if you do and you look that word serpent up, you're going to find that this is 8314 in the Strong's, the word seraph, seraphim. And literally, what God was telling Moses here is to make a fiery seraphim and put it on the pole. Put the seraphim on the pole. Now let's read verse 9. In verse 9, it said, And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if a serpent had bitten any man, when he believed when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, in verse 9 of chapters number, uh, chapter 21 of the book of Numbers, that word is 5175 nakhash, and that means crawly snake. So God says to Moses, you put the seraphim on the pole, and Moses puts a sneaky snake on the pole. Why did he do that? Was he trying to be rebellious? No. He was moving in divine revelation, and this was kind of a test, I think, from, from the Lord. But you see, the crawly snake is the sign of the seraphim cursed. You see, Moses knew something about the book of Genesis. He wrote it, for goodness sake. He knew that after uh, Satan was in the serpent and it was cursed, it took upon another form. And here we see that from this, we readily adduce that Satan is a seraphim right here in the text. And we can gain great value here from looking up a Hebrew word. And this is something, you know, it's nothing that's uh, any kind of um, high chicanery. You can get your Strong's Concordance and you can look it up for yourself. And from this text, we can see and deduce that Satan is a seraphim. So we have five. And if you think about the word seraphim, you know, it means fiery serpent, like a dragon, right? And in Revelation 12, we have that same de description, that old dragon, you know, the devil. Yeah. And it's, I mean, this it's plain and simple what it means there. But that's awesome, man, that you pulled that out. Most people probably have never 
looked that up. I remember, I remember back in my, when I was going to still going to church, cause I was like, maybe I can come in here and we can learn some things. And I remember that exact verse, bringing that up in a Bible study. And I've got that blank fluoride stare from everybody. And then the teacher's like, well, moving on. And, you know, just moved right on from, from that to nobody even had a, wow, that's cool. What, you know, what does this mean? You know, why is it talking about fiery serpents? They just, there's no, it's weird, man. It's a weird spirit at these churches sometimes. And that's why we talk <laughs> yeah. about things that nobody yeah. at church will talk about. And yeah. if you if you know that, if you've been at church, there's not too many times that this conversation will come up. And if it does, they're going to move on. So anyways. And why do they move on? Think about it for just a minute. And here in Numbers 21, we can deduce from this text that Satan is a seraphim. Now, why do they not want to go there? Because they are deeply invested in saying that in Ezekiel 28, Satan is that cherubim. Well, if Satan's a cherubim, seraphim, then he's not the cherubim in Ezekiel 28, is he? So you see, this is going to serve up some meals of sacred cows. But it's right there in the Word of God. That's in the Word of God. What is not in the Word of God is a single scripture that says Satan is Lucifer or Satan is the cherub of Ezekiel 28. That's not in the Bible. What I said there in Numbers 21, it is in the Bible. So you see, I like to teach what's in the Bible instead of what's not in the Bible even at the risk of not being as popular. Now, let's look at another one. Let's go to Isaiah 14, verses 24 and 25. Now, most David, people, before you go on to this, sure. this is going to be an interesting interesting one. We're going to go to our break. But first, before we do that, we're going to do what we call the Pounder's Pound, right? All right. My last name is Pounder, so we're going to pound. We're going to, you're going to take your mouse or you're going to take your phone and right below you is a like and a dislike button. And if you like it, I want you to smash the like button. I don't want you to break your phone. I don't want you to break your uh, your mouse. But we're going to like or dislike, and we're going to see what the changes. We need help with the algorithm with YouTube. We need help sharing this out. Um, YouTube no longer recommends our videos. Only 7% of our views are based off recommendation from YouTube, where it used to be 40%. So we are uh, having to, to be creative with this. So on the count of three, we're going to do it right now. One, two, three. Boom, like, and uh, give it a good like to give David some juice for when we come back. Those likes give David juice. Yeah. So, so. Yeah, and if you have a can of Palmer's Palmade, you can just toss it into the air at this point. <laughs> All right, here we go, guys. If this is true, then our country is in a lot of trouble. We would have these trips, these special trips. But he said, my, my daddy takes the bodies to the grocery store and he grinds them up and puts it in the hamburger. And nobody ever knows it. How can kids, six, eight, ten years old, be describing rituals that come from a book like the, like the Book of the Dead? It's hard to get your mind around people being capable of this kind of evil. Ideas are dangerous. Some are used to control you, some to break you free. idea that has simultaneously changed people's lives forever. Where? I hope that teaches you a lesson you never forget. In the span of a few years, this idea that the world thought was buried has found new life. Those who once trusted the space programs. More people need to get out there and question why they believe what they believe. The globe in the classroom the voices telling them they are seeing a mirage no longer believe. I'm not proving anything the water does it on its own. A mirage, a mirage, a mirage, a mirage, a mirage, a mirage. What you're seeing here is a mirage. 
You typically would not be able to see this from the Lake Michigan shore. We talked about this last night. Conditions are right on the lake, but we're actually seeing a mirage of the Chicago skyline. Best explained as simply a, a mirage. mirage. My name is Jake, and I witnessed the rise of this viral trend in an intimate way few other journalists have. I became friends with those who truly believe the world is flat. And I got into the mind of a flat earther before this information, which has led hundreds of thousands into this belief, is no longer able to be found. The globe head? You can actually see out of it and everything. So we got a, a little helmet that we ripped out in here and put in there. And then, and then we've got sunglasses that are actually American flag glasses. So they're going to get smacked with the truth. The, the reality in which we live in. You are worth this. You are worth this. Everyone is worth this. The bottom line, what if? What if they are onto something? What if we have been lied to? What if the Earth is flat? Time to find out before the reason so many have been convinced is stigmatized as too dangerous for public consumption. It is the mark of an educated mind to entertain a matter without accepting it. But what if the very thing presented destroys the reality you live in? Could you fight your own cognitive dissonance? This is the story of the people who have gone flat and never came back. Until someone goes up 60 cent miles up the edge of space and I can do it for $2 million. You're wrong! Don't even bring up Flat Earth to somebody until you check out how they are with the, the space park. Why the Earth is flat? Welcome back, everybody, to the Midnight Ride. And uh, we're going to get back into our teaching. Um, John Hall is going to be doing our questions tonight. Sister Donna is not feeling well, so we appreciate your prayers for her. That's why we were not able to upload our video of our Friday night FOJC to our YouTube channel. I imagine it's probably she's got that up now, but uh, she was not feeling well at all. So we appreciate your prayers for her. Now, let's get back into our text and... We want to look at this. This is another seraphim. Five seraphim, five Satans in the book of Enoch. Satan is the sixth, and here's our seventh, the Assyrian. Now, most people know that Isaiah 14, most people associate Isaiah 14, uh, verse 12, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? And as I said, this is literally a uh, son of Sakar, which was a well-known Canaanite deity, a.k.a. devil, that was worshipped at the time of the occupation of the land of Canaan. Now, there's what less people know is that in the latter part of Isaiah 14, there's another very powerful spiritual entity that's addressed, and that is the Assyrian. The Assyrian is addressed in Ezekiel chapter 31 and in many texts. In Ezekiel 31, it says that he was in the Garden of Eden, that he underwent a fall uh, just like Satan, that he was driven out of the garden and cast in to the nether parts of the earth unto Sheol. Very important, and this is overlooked and disregarded by most people, but whenever we disregard things in the Word of God, especially things that are so directly related to our spiritual life, I think we do that most definitely to our own harm. But let's look at this text. In Isaiah 14, let's look at verse 24 and 25. This is the other entity in Isaiah 14 that is addressed. 
The Lord of hosts has sworn, saying, Surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass, and as I have purposed, so shall it stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land, not Assyria, but the Assyrian, in my land, and upon my mountains tread him under foot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them, and his burden depart from off their shoulders. Now, it goes on to say this in verse 29. Now, here's another place where we're going to see the value of looking up words in the Hebrew in our Strong's Concordance. And we're going to see a very interesting corollary. In Numbers 21, 8 and 9, we saw two different Hebrew words translated serpent. We're going to see it again here. And the significance of this is huge. In Isaiah 14, 29, Rejoice not thou, whole Palestinia, because the rod of him that smote thee is broken. For out of the serpent's root shall come forth a cockatrice, and his fruit shall be a fiery flying serpent. Now, in the word translated serpent's root in this scripture is 5175. That is the word Nakhash. And the word translated fiery flying serpent, this is 8314. That is our word seraphim. Now this shows us a whole lot if we'll just look. It shows us that these seraphim are breeders, and there is a bloodline. Just like these seraphim originally fooled the angels into rebelling and cohabitating with human women, he showed them how to do it. Asbeel was the seraphim that showed them how to actually make this transformation. Here we see a prophecy that there is going to be from the root of the Assyrian, there is going to be a bloodline from the root or the seed of this fallen seraphim cursed bloodline is going to come back, a fiery flying serpent. It says, yeah, uh, rejoice not, uh, thou whole Palestinia. But in the day of Isaiah, the Assyrian nation was being driven by the Assyrian, the prince of Assyria here, as we would say in biblical terminology. But this prophecy says, now don't get too all about your little self because this guy's coming back. And when he comes back, you better be ready for him. And there's a bloodline here because there's a guy coming. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he was fully God, fully man, but there's one coming. He's going to be fully man, fully fallen angel. And he's going to come from the seraphim bloodline. And this is the guy we see in Revelation 13, the first beast. So we see here again the identification of the seventh seraphim here in Scripture. Five from the book of Enoch, plus the Assyrian, plus Satan. And this in the symmetry is very, very important because in the kingdom of Satan, which we showed beginning from the doctrine of Christ, it has organization and it has structure that there is this double set. I, well, I'm going to show you that now. I'm going to read this from, um, uh, it's a book called The Sixth and Seventh Book of Moses. I'll hold it up here for you. Now, this is a Kabbalistic book. And this is the text that is used by the practitioners of hoodoo, which is a form of Kabbalah that's practiced um, in the southern part of the United States. It is centered, uh, it originated in Memphis. Uh, it's popular in parts of Georgia 
and in Louisiana, down into the New Orleans corridor. In that little segment of the world, there's a lot of still a whole lot of hoodoo going on, I guarantee you. It influenced a lot of the early uh, blues magicians that come out of Memphis. We could talk a lot about all the lyrics and old blues songs that come from Memphis hoodoo. But I want to read from this book to show you, as I, I stated earlier, and after this we're going to show you two groups of seven godly angels, and we have two groups of seven ungodly angels. Now, on this book, in uh, page 160, uh, and it lists them, it says the angels of the seven planets, and we've also taught in previous lessons about the plantes, and, you know, being a biblical earther of we don't believe in planets as other people do, but the plantes are fallen powers in the second heaven. This is what it says about them. It says, these are the seven princes who stand continually before God to whom are given the names of the planets. And this book is full of invocations, how you call on these seven angels. It goes on to say on page 161, it says the names of the seven angels ruling all the seven ha uh, heavens must be order." Excuse me, let me say it again. The names of the seven angels ruling over the seven heavens. That's another clue. There's three heavens in the word of God, not seven. The names of the seven angels ruling over the seven heavens must be uttered first, and afterwards the names of those ruling over the seven planets. We've got two groups of seven fallen angels, the seven plantes, the seven angels of the seven heavens. Now we're going to show you uh, in just a moment, before we go to the question and answer, we're going to show you from the Word of God, two groups of godly angels. Now, in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 1, don't just read your Bible, read your Bible. You're going to see there's two things here. And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. There's two things there, aren't they? I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest and art dead. Now, the seven stars, the best way to interpret the Bible is the Bible. And that's what we're going to do. We're not going to say, I think this, I think that. We're going to see what the Bible thinks. Revelation 1.20, the mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars, are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So there's no this is the mystery revealed. The, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches we read about in the book of Revelation. This is, it's not maybe that's what they are. That's what they are according to the Bible. Now, let's look at Revelation 5 and 6, and let's see if we can figure out the seven spirits of God. And we can. It's right in the Bible. In Revelation 5 and 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Now, let's get a little help from the prophet Zechariah, and we'll see just what this is. In Zechariah 3 and 9, For behold the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. There they are. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In chapter 4, beginning in verse 6, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. 
Who art thou, O great mountain, before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain, and he shall bring forth the headstone with shoutings, crying, Grace, grace unto it. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. So, not by my might, but by the Spirit, Zerubbabel was doing it with the seven eyes of the Lord, the seven spirits before the throne that are sent forth into the earth. So you see, we have before the throne the seven angels of the seven churches. We're, uh, we're going to look at that whole concept on another time. That is unbelievable, that relationship there. But we not only have the seven before the throne, the angels of the seven churches, but we also have the seven spirits of God that are sent forth into the earth. So we have two godly groups of seven angels. On the dark side, we see the seven, the angels of the seven heavens and the seven, the angels of the seven plantes. So we got seven, seven on the good side, seven, seven on the bad side. This was the split caused by the Satans when they tempted the angels to fall. And then we could even take the dark realm and we could bring it down by fours and we could show that satanic quadrangle that plays out over and over and over to show the structure and the symmetry. And one of the teachings, we've done a lot of teachings on FOJC that have dealt with this concept, and one of them was the, I think we called it the four Kabbalistic cities in Israel. And in the Kabbalah in Israel, it explains the four elemental spirits by relating them to specific cities in Israel. Israel. And this gets into another whole level of first heaven spiritual beings, the Stochion. And uh, we we began in Ezekiel, uh, or excuse me, in Enoch uh, 61, and it was verse 10, and it talked about the powers over the waters. Well, Stochion are water spirits. So there's much, much, much uh, that are involved in this and uh, when you get into the intricacies of spiritual warfare and deliverance, um, it does, does, does make a difference. I got one more scripture here I want to read, John. Anything you want to say here, uh, John, before we kind of put a ribbon on this thing? You guys are witnessing a historic moment with David Carrico, one of the best uh, researchers and studious men of our time. And I just want to say that. That's what I want to say. Go ahead, David. <laughs> well, I tell you what, I like people say nice things about me. <laughs> you're my pal. You want to say nice things about me. You're my pal. Uh, we, of course, we, I know you're my pal yeah, anyway. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm just telling the truth. I mean, the fact of the matter is there's not a lot of people that break down scripture like this and have been studying it as long as you. Thankful to be able to hear it. And honestly, it makes so much sense. I mean, you went through the scriptures, showed it. You didn't even go through half the stuff we have here. Like you said, that's going to be a whole nother show on some of these things, but um, the beautiful thing about all of this, David, is that we greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. And uh, we have the power within us uh, through the Holy Spirit, through the Spirit of God to be the temple to where we can communicate with the Father as a priest, um, which is pretty amazing. And uh, so there's no need to be scared of these things, but to be aware of uh, it's hard to win a battle if you don't know you're in one. You know, if somebody comes up and clubs you in the back of the head with a bat, you didn't know it was coming, bad situation. It's the same with this stuff. If you don't know that there's an enemy actively trying to get you, um, then guess what? You're likely to fall down hardcore with a bat to the back of the head, and that's metaphoric, ex ex yeah. you know, obviously. So. My people perish for lack of knowledge, as one individual put it, and... 
We have been, how many episodes have we done on Enoch Common Territory? Ooh, uh, we are, I think, 25 in, maybe. 25, 20 something. Yeah. Uh, and we have studied and studied and dug in on this. And the more we've dug in, the richer it's become, and the more we've seen the relevance of it. And these things, I, you know, when you understand uh, the import, of that which we speak, um, I, I think it's it's very difficult for me to just say, yeah, you know, let's just forget about that. Um, but the most important thing we want to bring in per, into perspective is Colossians chapter 2 and verse 15. And all of these little and they're not little, but all of these entities and all of these beings that we could talk about, we in Christ have authority over them. You see, and that's where we can have faith and not fear. And I love this, and we didn't get to this. We, uh, we need to really uh, give another big picture a show on the book of Enoch in the spiritual realm because we're we're just scratching the surface here, believe me. And uh, in Colossians 2.15, all of these things, in Colossians 2.15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, in the book of Enoch, and we'll probably get into this into our next uh we'll do another like big picture spiritual world show on Enoch to help connect more dots but there's a portion in the book of Enoch where he walks up to the fallen angels I love it and he walks up and this man Enoch walks up to fallen angels in the flesh and rebukes them and puts them in their place and reads them the judgment that God is going to put on them. And every time I read this scripture in Colossians 2.15, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. What do you think these Mr. Big Stuff fallen angels felt when they had to listen to this mortal read them uh, what's for? Uh, yeah, but we can read all of these entities, the what's for from the Word of God, not in an arrogant way, but in the cross and through faith in the cross. In the name of Jesus, we have power over all of these fallen entities, and that's what will give us faith and not fear in these days that are ahead. I want to read uh, 2 Timothy 1.7, and after that, we're going to bring Brother John Hall on for the question and answer. And in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and and of a sound mind. Amen. Amen. Everybody give a, give a give big like on there to get let's get John on here get him some juice. These likes, <laughs> believe it or not, give us juice to keep us flowing. It's better than coffee. Dislikes too. So <laughs> Well, I want a little coffee too, but hit the like button too. Yes. Between the like button and the coffee, we're going to we're going to make it. We are. For a little while longer anyway. That's exactly it. John, Johnny Hall, are you with us? John Hall is also, uh, we better put our headphones on so we can hear him if he is with us. <laughs> John, are you there? There. Oh, yeah. we'll get him here, maybe. Yeah, probably can't hear him. But um, John Hall is a host of Cutting Edge, which is a show that comes on mornings here on NYS TV. And of course, every Saturday night, you get the midnight ride. Um, you know, always stay tuned for that. Get your, get your uh, recommendation, you know, get your. Um, Reminder by clicking the sub button, clicking on the little bell that's right there that's got the little bell on it. And also, we have an app. It's free, NYS TV. Uh, you, just, you can find it on Android or iPhone, and we send out notifications uh, when we're going live on the Midnight Ride from there, too. So make sure to stay connected because I tell you what, man, this is I've had to get creative, man, to get, to get the word out there. And, you know, being shadow banned is, no, is not a fun deal. It's not fun. We're used to, you know, back in the day, YouTube used to recommend us out to everybody, but. Not so much anymore. We're not on their lackey list, I guess. I don't know. So, anyways, John, you there, buddy? 
I is here. Can you guys hear me okay? We can hear you. Yes, sir. Oh, good, good, good deal. Uh, so yeah, this has been a wonderful show. Uh, two questions out of all the questions I've got for you gentlemen tonight. Uh, only two do not pertain to, to what the topic was tonight. It was heavenly laid with a lot of questions, and I hope you guys are ready. You should have got your coffee anyways, and if not, you can use Pounder's Pomade. Just a little underneath your nose will keep you wide awake. You can put it in your coffee also. Yeah. Who needs creamer <laughs> when you got Pounder's Pomade, right? There you go. There you go. Uh, are you guys ready for this? Yes. Okay, so the first question comes from Michelle. Question, what do we need to know about how to deal with fallen angels as opposed to Nephilim and demons? Is the only way to quote Archangel Michael from the Bible and say, the Lord rebuke you? That's a good question. Very good question. And we can go. Uh, as Ephesians 2, 5 says, we're seated in heavenly places. In Hebrews 4, 16, we can come boldly before the throne of grace. And this isn't some kind of a spooky visualization thing. This is an act of faith by where we come before our great high priest and intercessor. And we can plead our case in the courts of heaven. Intercessor means just like defense attorney. And he, we can... Uh, ask, and this is just prayer, for Jesus, we can say, Lord, rebuke thee. You know, you rebuke these fallen angels for us, you see. That's how that works. We can't rebuke them, but he can. Now, there's a big difference between these angels that are operating and accusing before the throne and the Nephilim that are their offspring. Uh, scripture tells us, and um, well, it's in Enoch chapter 15, the text that says that when the Nephilim died, that their departed spirits became what we read about as devils in our Christian scriptures. So, there's a big difference between dealing with a Nephilim or the spirit of a Nephilim, and I believe strongly that the Nephilim in the flesh will return, and the Nephilim in the spirit are here now. So this is one of the areas where understanding the differences here is going to enable us to have a effective prayer life, and an effective strategy for spiritual warfare. And I would say too that you know in in the I think it's Second Peter where it talks about not slandering these beings. Um, you know I, I think th you got to understand that you know obviously the Most High God, the highest God, which we believe is the God of the Bible, He He is in control. He created these beings to do His will, whether whatever. We can say about it. We can say, "Oh, that's you, I can't believe you did that." I can't believe, but he controls everything, right? Nothing happens without his, without his approval. Nothing happens. These satans do not come after you without his approval. Just like we see in the book of Job, he he went and he said, "Hey, can I go and and take out this guy Job? Because you think he's cool and all, but as soon as I get my hands on him, he's gonna he's gonna deny you like the rest of them are, you know." And so they have they have a job to do. And they're created for destruction, the Bible says, eventually. But they have a job. And when Michael came, when Daniel was praying, uh, the archangel Michael was held by back by one of these beings. And I don't remember the ex exact amount of time. How many days was that he was held back? Was it seven days he was held back? Something along those th lines. Um, by this king of Tyre, which is a powerful being. If it can hold back the archangel Michael, it is a powerful being. We, we have no business... Um, going and railing against these beings nor slandering them um i always hear these pastors oh the devil you dirty dog it's like man you know i don't think you realize what you're messing with here right we have the power to overcome demonic entities through through the authority of yeshua jesus we have that authority but when it comes to these beings you know even enoch when he was before the watchers he was respectful he didn't go off cussing at them or nothing like that they asked him to do a, do a deal but the fa ultimately, the Father's in control, and that's the beauty of having him run through our body and run through us, is that we um, we have this supernatural 
a connection that is different than a lot of people that have come before us. So anyways, I hope that made sense because I think I just skipped around a little bit there. But And I'm going to just give a thumbnail concept here. Uh, on FOJC on our YouTube, we have a playlist. I think it's called The New Spiritual Warfare. And the reason why I called it new is because after I come to the proper understanding of biblical cosmology, this totally changed my perceptions on spiritual warfare. But there's three heavens, and basically the first heaven is the air we breathe, what we live in down here. And in the first heaven, we have devils, and we have the stochian. And in the second heaven, which is basically from where the atmosphere ends to the firmament, the seven plantes are there. Above the firmament are the, the satans. So you see, you have to have a comprehensive understanding of what you're dealing with to be able to address it in a proper and in a biblical fashion. All right, guys, are you ready for the uh, second question? We're ready, and we'll try to be a little more brief, so we'll get through a few of these. No, 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 no. These questions, uh, again, as you guys said at the beginning of the program, uh, not a lot of the churches talk about this, or a lot of teachings out there straight from Scripture are, are given. And so there's a lot of questions tonight uh, regarding angelic beings and the host of heaven. So uh, I'm glad you guys are doing it, one on my part, too. So here's the second one from Ali. Ali Sheba, she says, and going back to the orbs that you were talking about at the beginning of the program, it says, the orbs of light remind me of Glinda the Good Witch in The Wizard of Oz. Yeah. We know that movie has a cult meaning. Could Glinda have represented a fallen Ophanum? Absolutely. This is a classic example of it. And you see this all over literature. Uh, this is another thing that accompanies many Marian apparitions, they talk about seeing these orbs of light. So yeah, this is a classic example that I think everybody of my generation and most young people too probably have seen this uh, this movie. Yeah, and this is absolutely a classic representation of the Ophanum. Excellent, excellent. Carolyn asked a really good question as well. Uh, she says, so then do we not have to fear uh, because the Lord has prepared us or has prepared his uh, remnant and our job is to fast and pray and read the word of God. So we will not be shocked and scared when it happens. So will we be shocked and scared when a supernatural occurrence happens before us? I will or be. should we be? <laughs> I will be. I'll be scared, but I'll get over it. And I mean, it's not like we're going to be immune to fear. I mean, this is scary stuff, and uh, it, but you see, we're not going to let fear overcome us. We're going to react in faith and not fear. We're going to be able to deal with it, and it's not like, um, you know, we're just going to do a cakewalk, but we're going to do the Jesus walk through this. So absolutely, if we are diligent in prayer and in the Word of God, we're going to be fine. We don't have to fear. We don't have to fear. That's absolutely right. And I think knowing knowing the outcome and knowing, you know, knowing that the scripture gives us outcome helps us not to fear. You know, when you see the sky rolling up like a scroll and you see um, Yeshua standing in the clouds, you know, you know, this is coming. Right. We know we know there's going to be an invasion of different beings than we're used to. We know this is going to happen. Of course, the world will tell you it's aliens. Uh, but as you can see, there's an angelic hierarchy. There's tons of different kinds of angels. And so this is what we're looking at. We're looking at uh, a secular worldview of what's going to happen versus a biblical worldview. We know that the righteous will stand. The wicked will be removed from the earth. Uh, we will see crazy stuff. There's no doubt in my mind. I mean, I've seen crazy stuff already and it's not even happened yet. You know, we've had, we've seen many, many, uh, amazing sights since being a believer that, that our King has allowed us to see in order to strengthen our faith and in order to help those around us. We're thankful for that. And I know a lot of you guys can connect with that. A lot of people listening tonight had a, has had an alien abduction experience or something like that. Uh, and now you have the tools to know what that is. You have the tools to be able to uh, encounter these things without being overwhelmed by these things uh, and being able to have them 
leave. And this is a pretty amazing thing, I think. Did you fellas see in the news uh, the last couple of days on Fox News, they came out and now they're stating that the United States Navy is now being open about uh, unidentified flying uh, objects that they've encountered being one uh, a video that's gone viral, especially by uh, the state media that we watch. And did you guys see that? No. No, but like I said earlier, uh, I talked to I talked to that one guy that was underwater surveillance in, in the military. Um, it was interesting. He showed he had a coin, and on that coin it had his symbol for what he was in the navy. And he's like, "Look that up. You know, you'll be you'll be uh, interested." He's like, "Once you figure out what that means, he's like, come back to me." And so I looked it up. It took me like an hour to find what that emblem meant, but it was underwater surveillance. It had like a little seahorse on it. And he told me um, some very interesting stuff. Let's just put it that way. And so that doesn't surprise me. In fact, I think they've known about it. Certain divisions have known about it for a very long time, for sure. There's a place in Arizona where you can go there on a nightly basis and you can see these orbs. A lot of people go there and just watch them. And I read accounts of riverboat captains over there where you live, John, uh, on the Ohio and where mm -hmm. we live on the Ohio, all the way up to Point Pleasant in West Virginia where the Mothman episode was. And these riverboat captains would say that they would sit nightly and watch these orbs play. And uh, oh, yeah. it was a nightly thing. I mean, this is something that millions of people have seen. Millions. Well, this next question that's coming up kind of goes towards that. Uh, you remember the spirals that people were seeing in the in this in the sky? And Trey he asked, could the spirals that appeared in the skies above Norway and other places a few years back be like the O'Phantom that you've been talking about tonight? I don't know if they would be O'Phantom. But certainly we have some kind of a spiritual manifestation going on there. I remember at the time looking at these and being impressed with how awesome they were. But um, I don't know if they were Ophanum, but they definitely were, I believe, um, some kind of an incursion into our world of the spiritual realm. Do you remember about these spirals, John? I I looked at it at the time. I don't remember a lot about them other than that. I don't remember a lot about them either, but it reminded me of the Marfa lights in Texas that you can go, and I don't know what, nobody knows what they are, but you can literally go there tonight if you're in that area or any night and see these lights in Texas, the Marfa lights. Have you heard of that? Uh -uh. Interesting stuff. We'll have to go check it out sometime. But uh, apparently there's these lights that um, near Route 67 – on Mitchell Flats east of Marfa, Texas, hmm. and constantly these lights going in, in the sky. Uh, nobody can explain it. Nobody knows exactly what they are. Um, very interesting, to say the least. So I, the swirls, I don't know about. I mean, there's so many different sightings that I've heard about online that they all kind of get jumbled together at some point. Okay. Uh, Carolyn asked another really good question Uh she says, did the watcher or was it their offspring that ruled kingdoms on earth and basically made slaves out of men and caused men to worship them? It was their offspring, the Nephilim. In the text John read, he read Genesis 6 and 4, uh, where it says that the sons of God came into the daughters of men and there were children born unto them that were men of renown. And these were the heroes that were worshipped as gods. And there's another text in the book of Enoch. Uh, it's in chapter 80 where it talks about uh, in the last days. And um, I might just pull that up here because it's a really cool text. And it talks about uh, the mistaking of these entities for gods and them being worshipped. While you look up that, David, I want to say something real quick about the last question. And we have to understand that these Ophanum aren't necessarily bad always. Just because there was some Ophanum that fell, there's also good Ophanum, like oh, the yeah. ones that Ezekiel saw. You know, there's, there is there is 
there's good and bad of all these beings. And unfortunately, um, we've seen, it, it talks about a third of the angels falling from heaven uh, because of the dragon. And um, you had some more verses about that too. I know David and Jubilees and stuff right. that we'll talk about next yeah. show that we do on that. But And I'll just read this 80 and 7. And the Nephilim were worshipped as gods here on the earth. And also the fallen angels in the second heaven were also worshipped as gods. In Enoch 80 and 7, And the whole order of the stars shall be concealed from the sinners, which might tell us that the world might have a few things wrong about cosmology. And the thoughts of those on earth shall err concerning them, and they shall be altered from all their ways, and they shall err and take them to be gods. And when we have what I call the cosmic boogie-woogie, and this is referred to in Luke chapter 21 about the cosmic disruptions Jesus said would happen, when this begins to happen, men will worship openly these celestial objects and beings to worship them so that they won't be destroyed. But absolutely. So in the uh, many of the heroes, like John said, Hercules and what f such forth, those were Nephilim. And also in this text, angels in the second heaven will be worshipped as God also. Excellent. Uh, this question uh, that's next is from Ali Sheba, and it goes right along with what you gentlemen were just talking about, about the Ophelim. Did they, did they, how many, not all the Ophelim fell, she qu she asked. Uh, but th the statement here, she says, or is it that if they are close enough for us to see them, they left their first estate, meaning, uh, let's see here, meaning they are fallen. Uh, so it goes along, as John just said, that, you know, did they did they all fall, the Ophelim? And you guys just answered that question saying not all of them are bad and good. I mean, they're, I mean, some fell and some didn't. But the ones that we can see, is they're the ones that left their first estate, correct? Not necessarily. Because in Ezekiel chapter okay. 1, Ezekiel saw an Ophelim. It was not fallen. It was bearing the very throne of God. So we can't say that every Ophanum we see is fallen. Also, all, go ahead. also the, the scripture said we might be entertaining un angels unaware. Uh, so we know that they come and we can see them. Um, whether we recognize them as being angelic beings or not, we can see them. In, in the book of Enoch, we did a study on that where it talked about the mountain where these lights proceed from this mountain. And these are angels that become like yeah. men on the earth, and they yeah. walk around like men and go, yeah. you know, it's kind of like a portal. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question comes from Mitch Mom. Are Satan and Lucifer the same? And if they are separate, are they both fallen angels? I believe... And there are teachings, we have in-depth teaching on this on FOJC YouTube and on NYS TV YouTube. I believe that Satan is a Satan. Now, that shouldn't be hard to believe, but Satan is the big guy. And Lucifer is a Nephilim. And he was the, the son, his father is named in scripture, Shakar who was a well-known devil that was worshipped in the land of Canaan during the time that Joshua went in. This can be well-established and documented. So Satan is the big guy, the seraphim at the head of the dark world. Lucifer is a very important entity on the dark world. Needless to say, he is the prototype of Nimrod and every other uh, world ruler. He was the first one to try to establish the new world order. He is the prototype of Nimrod and, uh, and Toshis of Pipfanes on down the line. And uh, as we said before, the final beast of Revelation 13, he will be the uh, ultimate guy there to try to take up what Lucifer initially began 
uh, taking over the world for Satan. And David, one thing too Excellent. that's interesting, you know, if you look at, you've you've talked about this before, but in um, Isaiah fourteen twelve, I believe it is. Let me look it up real quick. I want to. I don't want to say anything without having it in front of me here. I'm gonna look it up in the Strong's here. Do a trusty Strong's. Go to the feet of strength here with the trusty Psalms, verse twelve. Verse twelve. The word morning, shakar, son of the morning, is uh, make. I mean, it, to me, it, you can't mistake that. Like you said, you yeah. can't mistake it for anything other than being son of something. And um, so he's son of son of the morning, the son of the dawn, son of the daybreak. It's interesting too, and I know this isn't the same here, but in some, when they translate morning in some scriptures, they use the word leviathan which is a pretty interesting concept as well. So in um, there's an association in Job 41. It says that Leviathan has the eyes of the morning, Shakar. Mm. And I think that's kind of like the uh, old Hank Williams song. There's a little family resemblance. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, this this next question comes from Yeshua, my first love, two thousand. She asked, or he asked, are these other Satan's the same thing as Antichrist spirits? Sure, you could call them Antichrist spirits, and their primary function is in the third heaven, uh, as we see here that Satan accuses us, they aid and abet him in that process. And they are masters of deception. They are the Jesuits of the spiritual realm, we might say. And deception and accusation and mind games, this is the order of the day for these. Once they get us beat down with accusation, uh, they can just beat us around uh, like a ping pong ball. So that's basically um, their forte. Excellent. This next question is is for both of you. Uh, why this comes from William? William asks, "Why is it important for us to know all these Satans? Isn't one enough?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, really. Um, and as, as I said earlier, people that want to totally disregard the book of Enoch, I'm not going to fight and bicker with you. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's fine, but maybe it's not fine. Uh, because as we have brought out in this show tonight, just from the word of God, there's a complexity there. In the, in the good kingdom and in the bad kingdom. And things that are in the Word of God aren't there by accident. And I believe, as I have said, that the book of Enoch is a book that was given for God's saints in the end time tribulation, which I believe we are on the very brink of. So I find great value in it. And whether you, the listener tonight, finds value in it, that is up for you to decide. One Satan is one too many Satans. That's true. Oh, man. But, uh, like, you know, this is what we like to do. We, we could talk about football. We could talk about Donald Trump. We could talk about, you know, whatever. But we prefer to dig into the scripture, research it, go ancient with it, and uncover the things that we, we care about. That's why we do this show is because that's what we like to do. And uh, so – that's that. We love doing this. This is love our thing. It, this is our deal. Love so, it. Yeah. Jump in those Enoch waters. It's pretty fine. Yeah. <laughs> Do you some swimming. And at the same time, at the same time, I just want to, I, I have a question of my own, uh, dealing with the demonic spirit realm, uh, as you are walking this out with Messiah and, and, and doing as he's asked you to do, and you encounter these supernatural beings, 
these demonic spirits. Have you noticed there's a trend like one spirit will follow you around until you absolutely snuff it out by the name of Jesus? Uh, have you noticed that there is like uh, familiar spirits that follow families around? Little Satans kind of like they just there's so many of them. I, I don't know. It just seems like, yeah, one will follow your family around. And it, are they a part of that? Yeah, and this is another whole aspect of the complexity is the generational spirits that go through families, um, understanding the need to break these generational curses by the power of the cross. And you see, a a lot of people will tell you, and well-meaningly so, that when you're born again, you know, Everything is just fine. You've got the victory, and you do. But you see, when we're born again, we don't become bubble boy and bubble girl to where we're not uh, affected by our demonized culture and by the things that have gone before in our families. And we have to deal with these things if we're going to have real freedom and victory. That's why I say in confronting the demonic, we need to be aggressive, 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 aggressive. We don't become passive. We are aggressive in our prayer life and in our spiritual warfare because we have the victory, but it doesn't operate like automatic transmission. It isn't just like, oh, I'm saved. We're good. No, it's an aggressive. It is a spiritual battle that we are in. That means we fight. And if we fight properly, we win because Jesus has already won. And another another thing too, which is really an awesome word, by the way, if you look at the word genealogy, you look at the word genius, you work at the word genes, you look at the word genetics, you look at that, it goes back to the word genie, right? The word, this, this word, the spirit, you know, the spirit of the family that passes through and goes to, and you look at the epigenetics idea of this stuff and you look at the curses that are passed down from family to family, it could very well be tied with a specific spirit because lots of spirits have uh, their own kind of sin that they love to push on people. You, you can see that in the book of Enoch and you see that in, in the scripture. But we, we need only look at our words to kind of figure out that there are generational curses, there are generational spirits. I believe, 100% I believe in that. And um, very, very interesting stuff to say the least if you go on a study with that one. So it is important to know all about uh, who the enemy is and how to deal with that enemy. So well, it is important. I, mean, I believe it, I think so. so. Uh, yeah, I believe so. Absolutely. Okay. I, you know, so, I think it's obvious. Uh, the next question that's coming up, I'm sorry, guys. Uh, you've got a lot of questions on this topic. I mean, a lot. Um, the next one comes from Greg. Uh, is Azazel Satan? I mean, Deuteronomy is is hard to make sense of unless he is. I mean, the whole scapegoat ritual is about Azazel. So is Azazel Satan? No, he's not. In Enoch chapter 6, he is the leader of the angelic rebellion of those that came down upon Mount Hermon. And in the book of Leviticus, in the Day of Atonement ritual, the scapegoat, literally in the Hebrew, is Azazel. And this is symbolic of, and as we said, in the scriptures, what we read of in the Christian scriptures is the devils. This is explained in the book of Enoch chapter 15 as the departed spirits of these Nephilim. And this is symbolic, of course, there of the cross, which the Day of Atonement points to, of the defeating of all these principalities and disembodied spirits and embodied spirits, or those that are still in their spiritual body, we might say, and are not disembodied. But this is uh, pointing to prophetically, obviously, of the defeat of all these things at the cross of Christ. And and can Amen. I say something and, real and real question, quick to kind of right, just go over the last the last question people were asking? I saw somebody ask, "How do we break these generational curses?" Yeshua came and died to break yeah. the curse of the law, to break the curses that were against you. In Deuteronomy, it says, 
I've set these before you as a witness against you in heaven and in, in earth. And he comes to break these generational curses. His blood has the power to change, literally change our DNA, literally yes. change our DNA and become a seed, a seed of his, seed of Abraham, heirs according to the promise. Um, thankfully, there is a way to break those generational curse, uh, curses. I come from a long line of alcoholics, uh, a long line of Freemasons, a long line of occultists. It was broken with my dad who became a believer. You know, this is a, a new legacy he passed on by deciding I'm going to follow Yeshua. I'm going to follow and I'm going to do what's right. And so we have that power to break them. This is iniquities, right? When, when you, when uh, David said, wash me in my sin or, uh, forgive me in my sins and wash me from my iniquities. What are iniquities? What is he having to wash out? Right. He's having to wash this stuff out. Different words for sin and iniquity. And, um, definitely he has the power. We have to come boldly before the throne which is really, you guys should check out the show we did a couple weeks ago on the on on uh, what what did we call it, David? Do you remember um, about the ancient ancient um, priesthood, right? The ancient priesthood, yeah. and see what that means to be uh, allowed to go before the throne, to have our body as the temple, to be priests after another order, to be. This is a really important concept. If you are suffering from generational curses. You must repent. You must ask him to wash him, wash you of your iniquities, and you must move forward in his power. Get baptized, go forth, produce fruit, and he will do it. I used to be a drug addict. I was a violent man, very violent. I was, uh, I mean, they had me on all kinds of drugs to keep me from being so violent, and they didn't work. I was on, like, the highest dose of Depakote you can think, and that's something they give for people that have seizures to calm them down, anti-seizure medicine, anti-psychotic. I was on these drugs. I was on all kinds of other things, and... He changed me. I mean, you don't, you got, if you guys would have known me 10 years ago, you would be like, wow, this is crazy. And, and, and I, it's, it's, it is nuts because it's like, what, what in the world happened? He has that power to transform you from the inside out. Um, it's an amazing thing. Amen. Amen. And I've got the two perfect gentlemen to a answer this next question. It's from mercy on us. Uh, so the book of Enoch one and two were written by God's Enoch and book three was written by a rabbi. Can you help clear this? Who wrote Enoch one and then the rest of the books? First Enoch was written by Enoch. Second and third Enoch are absolutely bogies. And third Enoch was written we know by Rabbi Ishmael. And Rabbi Ishmael was a rabbi that lived about 75 AD, and he rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And Rabbi Ishmael had conversations with an entity by the name of Metatron. And when you reject Jesus Christ and then you start having visitations of heavenly beings, it's not a good one. And it's from Third Enoch by Rabbi Ishmael that we learn about Metatron. And we've talked quite a bit about Metatron on previous shows. And right now, uh, there's a fellow by the name of Rabbi Yitzchak Sapira that is teaching in his book, The Kosher Pig, there's a big section that's entitled, Jesus is Metatron. And this is not just a little bit wrong. This is wrong on steroids, extremely dangerous, obviously. But this is being propagated big time in the Messianic movement, and people are going along with these things, and this is just hugely, hugely wrong. So first Enoch is the only good Enoch we got. Second and third Enoch, stay away from them. You can tell the difference okay. when you read those things. You can tell. Oh, yeah. You can see, you can feel it in your spirit. If you're, you know, you read first Enoch, it gives a whole different uh, whole different meaning to everything that you, you hear, and it, and it bears witness. Second and third Enoch has a almost a a darkening feeling oh, that is. you get when you read yeah, it, you it know, is. almost uh, creepy. Yeah, it is. Okay. Uh, this next question comes from Caesar. Uh, is Baal the brother of Satan as described uh, in the Canaanite pantheon? And can it also be a sephirin? So the question is, ba is Baal Satan's brother? 
described in the Canaanite pantheon, and can it also be a Sephirin? Okay, now in the text that Caesar, Caesar is referring to, the Rosh Shamar documents, and I did a teaching on FOJC YouTube. Uh, I think I called it the true identity of Baal, and I got into this in a lot of detail. And if you break it down, I believe that Baal, now this is going to sound a little weird, but uh, Baal is Lucifer's uncle. Now, <laughs> that almost, well, that does make me giggle a little bit, but this is the story that's told on the dark side. And uh, Baal is a Nephilim. He is, a lot of people say, well, Baal, that's Satan. Well, no, he isn't. And you see, people on the dark side, uh, you know, Jesus said that uh, a lot of times the children of the world are wiser than the children of light. And uh, it takes one to know one, I guess you could say. And uh, this is uh, what is told in the, taught in these Rosh Shamara documents, which are satanic text. But what we learn from this is their version of the dark kingdom. And according to them, if I remember correctly, uh, Baal would actually be Lucifer's uncle, odd as that would sound. But they, we're talking about Nephilim bloodlines, Nephilim families. And when we get back, in, in the book of Job, it talks about the morning stars at creation. We're all together and singing for joy. And the morning stars were the the first defectors, these uh, these seraphim. And we see um, Shakar. And when we look at this, we're talking about a first or second generation Nephilim with someone like Lucifer and Baal. And these guys, uh, Lucifer, realistically could have been a couple hundred feet tall. Uh, we're talking about an unbelievably huge monster of something we would see uh, in the Clash of the Titans, something like this. But uh, absolutely, Caesar is thinking in the right direction there. I, I See, I heard he was his own grandpa. That's what I heard. I heard that song <laughs> on the Grand Ole Opry, I'm my own grandpa, but Grandpa Jones, yeah. yeah. I'm a, I know what you're talking about. I'm How are you? Grandpa. We could probably sing that for you, John. You? And I listen, if you don't want us to start singing, <laughs> I'm my own grandpa, we probably better do one more question. And I apologize. Hit the, hit the hit like the, button if you want them to sing it, though. Hit that like no. button. No. <laughs> Let's give it juice, man. We get. <laughs> I, you know, I think that could ruin the whole show. You know. Well, it might. Uh, it might, yeah. the best thing it ever. might help, but me... I don't know. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna ask two questions. I hope you guys don't mind. Uh, okay. Two questions. The the first question uh, I'm gonna ask is, uh, it just to clear something up in the live stream chat over on now UCTV NYSTV.org. Uh, in the live stream chat, there is a discussion going on. So is, does this make uh, uh, Lucifer a Nephilim, and how can that be possible? Can a Nephilim be in a, a, a fallen state, or I, I, maybe you can help us understand that a little bit better. Well, Lucifer, Is he a Nephilim? or Lucifer can be a Nephilim because the Bible says he's the son of Shakar, a... right you know, a, a fallen angel. So, yeah, uh, he can be a Nephilim if the Bible says he is. And you got to understand the word Lucifer, well, I, it comes from, it's one verse in the Bible. So there's, you know, you can't really form a whole doctrine off this guy other than what it says there. And it says yeah. he's the son of Shakar. So, I mean, the people, you know, of course, here's, here's the thing that a lot of people don't know, but Lucifer was the God that the Freemasons worshiped. And it was a female deity that they worshipped. They called it Lucifer. And um, one of the, 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 to ascribe the Freemasons, the Catholic Church, they love to ascribe the Freemasons with the worship of Lucifer, mm -hmm. a worship of Satan. And so that word has been pushed as Lucifer being Satan for a very long time. But, you know, there's a lot of things that have been pushed for a long time that are crap, you know? So we got to decipher. What's what? I mean, if you only have one yeah. verse that has the word Lucifer in it, and you only have one explanation for who it is, when it says it's the son of Shakar, 
then it's the son of Shakar. But to me, I there mean, you go. You know, yeah. And according to the Bible, like John said, we we saying it over and over and over. Lucifer is the son of Shakar, who was a fallen angel worshipped by the Canaanites. This is readily documentable. And that's what the Bible does say. I say that. There's no scripture in the Bible that says Lucifer Satan. But everybody wants to say that instead of what's in the Bible. So it's just a matter of what be what's we've we've come to expect yeah, it's, from it's conditioning. It is because I mean yeah. and, and I have to break my condition down every day. So I'm not we're not trying to push down on anybody because there's there's times that I'm like, why did I ever believe that? What, where, yeah. where did that come from? You know, and, and so that happens, but we just have to be sure. able to look at the text and see what it really says, which is really important for a lot of you to do. Yeah. If you're a new believer or if you just want to know what the scripture says, start at the beginning. Start over. Forget everything you've heard about the commentary on the Bible and start from the very beginning, and you will learn so much more than you ever thought you was possible. One more question, or I'm going to start so saying it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, you guys have absolutely ignited a lot of questions, and I am saying there are, are maybe 25 or more questions just on this topic alone, and only two out of all the questions that have been gathered tonight, only two do not pertain to the subject. So you guys have ignited uh, uh, a spark in folks to study their scriptures, but to also ask good questions. And, and so, I, I'm, uh, I just me... want to say briefly, John, that we are going to do another show where we're going to deal with more of the structure of the spiritual world from the Book of Enoch. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to answer some more of them there. And, and we apologize. We just can't get to them all. And it's hard for us to answer these questions quickly. It's just the nature of it. So if we didn't get to your question, please don't be offended. And we're going to be revisiting this topic in the not too near future. And hopefully maybe you can get your question on air then or in the context of the broadcast, find some answers. So we'll do our very best. Well, I have got the last question and this is for you both. Uh, but before I tell you what it is, the live stream, nystv.org live stream, folks, are all singing. Please sing, David. Please sing. <laughs> they want you to sing. They're all they, in their They just thing. don't know what they're asking. They just don't know. Do it, David. Do it. We know you can do it. Come on. <laughs> Hit that like button. Maybe it'll give David the juice. <laughs> So the last question has nothing to do with the topic tonight, but I want you guys to address it. Are there fables in the Bible? Well, the Bible mentions fables, and it says not to believe Jewish fables. And the fables that the Bible warns against are the fables that are transmitted through the oral tradition that comes down through the Talmud, through the Kabbalah, uh, that is specifically termed Jewish fables. So in the Word of God, it helps us to understand fables. Just like in Genesis 6, we can understand that Hercules, which John mentioned, and many of the gods in Greek, in Greeks and of the Greeks and Romans, uh, these were actually Nephilim that were alive and lived. So the Bible helps us to understand fables, but the Bible is not a fable, and the Bible warns us against fables. And uh, uh, basically, fable means fiction, and uh, the Word of God is true and not fiction. If there were a chance that all books in the world could be shaken from the library except for the word of god that would be an amazing thing uh, unfortunately there's like david said there's lots of fables out there especially jewish fables and i know that that word i said that to somebody one day they're like you're a racist i'm like no i mean the bible says jewish fables yeah and we have those in kabbalah we have those in in uh in the jewish mythologies and all these different things i mean those are big and they actually have misled a lot of people to following after other gods that's what we see in the book in in exodus where the people followed after that calf, where the people followed after Baal over and over and over and over again because they kept falling for these stinking fables. They kept getting propped up 
<laughs> from the t beginning of time to the end, if we could stick with the word of truth, I mean, okay, so if somebody wants to tell me that the word of truth is not good, it's not right, that's fine. But at least I have a base to where I figure, figure is the truth. Most people are their truth that moves every five seconds. Um, and, it, and it moves to, oh, well, this this might be right in in this scripture. This might be right in, in that book. This might be right in that book. To us, our, our truth stays the same, right? Because we believe in the word of God. We believe that the Father has the power to make his word um, go out to the nations that everybody can understand it on every language. He has that possibility to do that. And we're thankful for it, obviously. And obvi there's been a lot of things in our lives, mine and David's and John's and really everybody on AEC TV, that God has proven himself to us that he He is who he says he is. And we know uh, what our truth is based on. Now, if you don't agree with it, that's fine. We can work with that. You don't have to agree with everything we say. But the fact is, we, we believe is truth is truth. We're not going to go off on some, well, it says this in, in the Nag Hammadi, so maybe that's the truth. No, we're not going to do that because we're going to stick to a truth level, right? Now, we might look at that book and be like, well, that's not, doesn't line up with what my truth level has to say. So, I mean, you're going to have to make a decision. It's, uh, you know, in the scripture, in Joshua, um, choose this day whom you will serve. You're going to choose the gods before the flood, or you're going to choose the most high God. And, and this, it's time to choose who you're going to serve, what the truth is, because if the truth shifts every which way, we're all lost. We're all sunk. Not one person in this world will have any understanding whatsoever if the truth constantly shifts. If you're taking into account millions of things for your truth, you will never find it. And that's a scary thing to think of. So the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. It says that. It also says, seek him with your whole heart and you will find him. And so that is what we try to tell people. Seek him with your whole heart and you will find him. Also, study to show thyself approved. Also, you only have one teacher that needs to be teaching you. That's the Holy Spirit. Amen. I mean, you stick to those things. You shouldn't go wrong. Right? Amen. That is some dandy, dandy, tickety-boo advice. <laughs> no doubt about That's it. That's hunky-dory, man. Oh, man. Hunky-dory, tickety-boo, uh, you name it. As you can all tell, we better stop. <laughs> so with that, we're going to thank John Hall so much for helping us out tonight. We love you and Patty a whole bunch bunch we probably even love patty more than you but we love you both and um so uh you be safe and blessed and thank you so much for helping us out and for all you do um we want to thank you the midnight ride listeners you are the greatest we thank you so much we could not do what we do without you and a big thanks you to uh, John Hall or John Pounders and now you see TV for providing this platform. Any final thoughts, John, before we wrap this up? Thank you guys once again for joining us live. It's awesome to have such a, a live audience and it's awesome for those of you that are, are watching it live and you're watching this as a rerun um, on YouTube every Saturday night, 10 PM, every Saturday night, uh, download our free app. You'll get notifications if you don't get them from Facebook, YouTube. Um, go to FOJC Radio. Subscribe on there on YouTube. Um, you know, we're trying to get creative, man. We're not. We don't. We don't get all these uh, recommendations for people to see our videos like a lot of these mainstream channels get. Un unfortunately, I wish we did. I wish I could uh, make that happen again, but it's not happening. So we have to be creative. You guys are our our line of defense, you guys have to, our line of offense, you guys got to share these videos out and um, we got to do what we can to get them out the best we can. No doubt about it. That's my last word, David. Thank you so much for the show, David. It was awesome. Such a fantastic broadcast and a fantastic understanding of this. Um, oh, it's always a pleasure to do shows with you and it has been for the past few years. I'm thankful for it. Well, thank you so much, John, for your kind words. And I feel the very same way about you. And I probably feel best of all when I'm here with you on the midnight ride, sending out the truth of God and sending out our missiles into the kingdom of darkness here on the midnight ride. So with that, we're going to say 
High five and good night, everybody. We'll see you next week, 10 p.m. Central, on the Midnight Ride. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast. Rise up, rise up, rise up.